There's a lot of blood inside the building. You can't teach a man how to be a man. Either he is or he ain't. Hey, 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 you know what it is. It's your man, Peter Shue, Rich in the Hood, season two. And we're getting ready to blast you out the box today. Yes, I'm here to do the interview only for my man, Val, because I don't come and do interviews no more for nobody else. But this is my guy, so let's get it popping. Like I said, this is going to be the hottest show you ever heard coming from me because um, everybody be asking me questions, asking Val, asking all the the other um, podcast is about me. Well, let me tell you, man, it started when I was a young kid and I was growing up in a rough neighbor in the Bronx, South Bronx, Hunts Point, where you had to have some gangster in you. You had to be strong or else you was going to be hit. You know, they had kidnappers, they had everything in there. They had. It was everything going on in this joint, but you know, I survived it, you know, and then being black and Chinese growing up in that joint, that was rough. You see what I'm saying? So I really had to um, be on point. But, um, you know, I always had this glow in me and the aura that people just wanted to follow. Whether I was a stick up kid, whether I'm getting high, whether I'm doing anything, if they see me do it, they want to do it. That's how it was just like that. And, you know, I didn't want to be that guy that they'd be the leader. Actually, when we were sticking up, my cousin was the leader. But then, after a while, everybody just wanted to follow me. So he he was man enough, and he was, you know, that's why I love him to death. He was man enough to take a back seat and let, let me run with this because everybody, you know, they just had so much love for me. And if I said, we're going to go do something they like bet because they know i'm gonna go and i ain't leaving them and whatever happens happens so that's how it was and then we went on we went on to start getting money but i was losing a lot of guys to um either getting arrested or getting killed so the stick up game was getting out of hand and then um we was robbing everybody and you know they tried to kill us one time in the apollo you know, when Smokey was performing, they, you know, they got a couple of guys, but they, I was on the other side. And I was young at the time, too. So, you know, that's when Smokey said, and you could look it up, Smokey said, I'll never come and perform in Apollo again. So, you know, I was just going, going through life with that. And then I got addicted to the sniffing coke at one time because everybody I was around was sniffing coke. And even though I was young, you know, my cousin and all the big ballers and all the big bosses and stuff was sniffing coke. And, you know, I got hooked on it for a minute. So it was crazy that, um, yeah, so, you know, growing up in South Bronx, like I was telling you, you know, we was the only, I was the only black and Chinese guy in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, I had two sisters and my mother, grandmother, and my father at the time. And we had one family that was white in the neighborhood you know, on my block. And, you know, it was just, you had to be, like I said, you had to be strong. I mean, I, I went through so much growing up, going with the bullies and, you know, being um, pressured by my father to, like, step my game up because, you know, he was trying to toughen me up, so he was real hard on me. And, you know, I could be in a fight and, you know, anybody else's parents probably want to come and break the fight up. But the kid might run over and say, you know, your, your son is fighting. And he, 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 he'll he say some crazy shit like, yo, is he winning? And and then keep on moving. So, you know, I just had to go through a lot. And then I had to fight the guys that was older than my sisters because they, if they get into something, I have to go out there and represent. And my sisters was like two and, and probably five years older than me. So I was taking a lot of ass whippings. And, you know, but, you know, ass whipping is a lesson. So, you know, you got to... You learn from all that so after a while it became nothing to me then when my father my mother took my father 38 long and hid it from him and I found it you know after she she threw it into the garbage can that became my first gun and once I picked that up you know that's when I had stability in my life and equalized 
my weight loss because if I'm 100 and something pounds, but my gun 60, 70 pounds in my eyes, then I'm, the weight's even now. And nobody stop, everybody stop messing with me because they know I would put two in their ass. So that's what it was, you know. And um, the neighborhood, you know, was just a, a rough neighborhood. It was, it was so much going on. People dying every day. People getting robbed every day. And uh, I seen them cut somebody's head off in front of me. It was, you know, the prostitutes was crazy out there. Dope fiends is crazy. It was, it was, you know, you just had to put up with that. So as you go into school, you had to deal with the gangs and stuff. And the gangs, you know, they want to be bullies. They, there's a bunch of them, man. You know, there was one time when I was in junior high school, this 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 girl, um, I forgot the name of the gang, but she 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 had to get initiated, I think. It was a Spanish gang. And she said I grabbed her ass and I never I never even touched that girl's ass. But the 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 thing was you had to apologize. And I wasn't trying to apologize, so they surrounded me. They was getting ready to beat the shit out of me. And my man God bless the dead, Debbie. He was like, yo, yo, say you sorry, man. Say you sorry. So I was like, it hated me. It hurt me so bad to say it. So I ended up saying, I'm so I apologize. So when I went upstairs, you know, I seen this this girl who's like a sister to me, still like a sister to me. Her name is Tanya. She was a black spade at the time. So she was always see me and ask me if I'm okay and hug me and whatever. So she's like, What's wrong with you? Because she should see it in my face. She's, and Debbie, you know, <laughs> Debbie t- told her everything. <laughs> so, yo, he told her what happened. She said, who? So I told her it was on the fourth floor. So we went back, she went back downstairs. Man, Tanya took the girl in front of her whole gang, slammed up against the wall. She said, you ever disrespect my, my little brother again? You know, and I looked at myself like, what? Why I couldn't do that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's that's how it does. And you know, to this day, me and Tanya's close. Actually, she hit me today, said good morning to me. So I love her like a sister. The only thing that I really fell in love with when I was growing up was basketball. You know, that was my thing. I wanted to be I wanted to be Ward Fraser so bad. At the time, I thought he was so cool on the court for the Knicks and um. He, he just put on a, in a game seven game. Never seen this in my life. No game seven championship game has it, anybody put these stats up. 36.19 assists and like seven rebounds, I think it was. But that was my thing. I used to cut class, go play ball. My father used to want to put me in uh, martial arts schools. And, you know, I tried it, but it wasn't my thing. And plus, the trip was all the way down to Canal Street. And I love all the way up in the Bronx. So that was... Too long a ride to be coming home at nighttime and, and, and have to keep doing your, your classwork. So I, I just was playing ball every day. And um, that, that was my first love. So we played ball, cut class, me and my man. At the time, his name was James, but his name is Jamal now. We used to just play all day. My, my favorite point guard, Earl Ruffin, he used to give me the ball and I just put work in. Poor G. So we... We just was basketball fanatics. So, you know, I'd be cutting class and my father and mother be in the principal's office. The niggas yelling out the window, yo, your, your, your mother and father's in the principal's office. I said, like, oh, damn, that's another ass whipping. Because when I got ass whippings, unlike what they do now, I got ass whippings by three people. My grandmother whipped me first, then my mother whipped me next, and then when my father come home for work, that's the last one. I used to try to duck it by going to sleep. That nigga wake me out my sleep and whip my ass. So I took a lot of ass whoopers from them from misbehaving. So you know, going through going through all that basketball stuff, you know, that's when I I got the places where I used to go 371, Club 371 and Disco Fever and the, the Hilltop. And that's when I started getting hooked on um the coke, sniffing the coke. Never smoked it, but sniffing it. And you know, the baddest DJ back then, and I don't care what nobody say, was DJ Hollywood. Vicious on that mic. So I still love listening to his his music. Guys, should go to 371, because they used to have, you know, where do you have some fun at 371? 
you know, and he had so much cool raps that he was putting out there. He was he was the first rapper to me that really was fantastic. So after we finished 371, then we go to Disco Fever. And Disco Fever make you a believer because you be in there snipping and, you know, you having um, a good time. And then um, you be high as hell, so you don't want to go home yet. So then you go to the hilltop. That's right up the street. So when I used to come out the hilltop, it'd be like 11 in the morning, and my eyes, the sun be on you like a vampire. You'd be like covering your eyes, and it was just crazy, a crazy feeling. But, and then, you know, that's why I had to stop playing ball, because I used to have games that same day, and had to get just like two hours sleep, three hours sleep. And that coke was taking a toll on me, and... It was it was messing up my my heartbeat, so you know I never took myself out of the game before, but this time I had to take myself out. But my my heart was going like that, so I saw it myself. And my man Earl and Porgy, they looked at me and said, "Yo, it's over for you." I said, "Yeah, I know." So then I started coaching because I love the game so much. So I started coaching the game, you know, you know. After I was played in the buck, I started coaching in the buck, and I started bringing my teams in. And because the future asked me to put a team in, he said, you got to represent just up there first from the Bronx. So I was thinking about a name to come up with. So I said, fuck it, the name of my team is going to be Taking No Prisoners. So when I put the Taking No Prisoners out there, I, had, I would bring 500 shirts to a game, every game. And the shirts had two Glocks on the side. Um, Smoke come out of the guns. Um, two st- tombstones on the back with the names of the teams. And the, and the front would say taking no prisoners. So everybody wanted them shirts bad. The police even wanted them. So they used to like sweaters for the shirts. And it was homage with black letters in it. And then I brought the Nick, Nick shorts for everybody and um, sneakers. So we had, you know, my team used to always have to go back to school though, so we we um we had some good ball players though. I mean, I could name you know Strick that's, that passed away, um, Mo, Ty Dangerous, that's my guy. Ty, Ty Dangerous was a bad man, man. He was a bad man. We had the future. We had um, um, Mike Red, God bless the dead. We had um David Lopez. We had Anti Gravity. You know, we just, it was so many, I might have left a few names out, but we had so many ball players. And so I coached, I had them playing. I took Master Robin up to Mount Vernon before Master Rob was a beast. I took him to Mount Vernon. He put on a show up there. And we was playing in them leagues with, with um, when I stopped playing, we was going up there and play against Gus Williams, Scooter McRae, Rodney McRae, Lois Moore, Ray Williams, Glenn and Big Hands McMillan. So we was, you know, we just, I was just letting them ball. So that was my side thing. And uh, Cameron and Mace talked about me not too long ago on their show about me being up in the rock and stuff and always had him, having my gun in my bag. But yeah, that was real rock. That other stuff is just like the NBA right now, watered down. But when we was it, when we had the rock, Mousy, shout out to Mousy. Mousy's a good dude, you know. Um, Ed, Ed Rice, OG Wan, they all had teams out there, so Flavor Unit, um, Any Way You Want It, Mousy's All-Stars. So, you know, you had a lot of good teams out there, and we just had fun, you know. Um, one of my favorite players was Terminator. I never got to get him on my team, but, you know, he, he had a pro game. He had a pro game, even for his height. He played tough, you know. I really want to bust him in his head because he... He he'll be a player against us and he'll he'll play that he he play that tough D on dudes and he gets away with grabbing and holding. But he's a great player. I mean you had so many you had the um half man, half amazing. There was so many basketball players out there that was worthy of the praise, you know. Um Speedy, Craig Pendergrass. I loved the ball players that was out there. Um Iron Man, Tommy Starks. You know, it was so many good ball players, the, the twins, the riflemen. So, and a, a crazy shout out to my man Greg Mavis that started the Ruckers, and I miss him, miss him daily. You know, he's 
Yeah, you know, people ask me a lot about the 70s. You know, and the 70s, 70s was kind of, um, I was still trying to get me my first piece of, you know, booty. So the 70s was like fun time for me and junior high school and all that. And um, man, I, I'm a sucker for love. So there was some pretty girls in, in junior high school that I barely was trying to get with. Even in public school, I was trying to get with. I love, you know, and then in them days and times, when you like the girl, you said hit on her all the time. So you be hitting on her and, and, she, and she be crying you trying to show her that you really like her. And I was caught up in that. But I wasn't that hitting them hard, but you know, just sitting on them. So there was this girl named Robin that I liked. And she had some big brothers. She used to go get her brothers after me, not to run and go get my sister. So, but when I got to junior high school, I mean, that's when, you know, stuff started hitting the fan. That's when I started getting, you know, a little bit of coochie, you know? And the whole thing is, there were so many cute, pretty girls in there. I mean, me and my man James used to always, you know, be on the lookout. You know, we even had this um, staircase where they everybody come to the cafeteria. So the dudes used to take the bulbs, the light bulbs out the, out the staircase. So when the girls come down the steps, you know, they just be grabbing their butt and everything. <laughs> you know, screaming, screaming and everything, you know. So it was funny at the time. But... You know, that's that was our wreck, and um, everything comes to an end. So that stopped after a while because they start suspending dudes that got caught up in that staircase. So you know, it, you just had to go through things to, to grow a growing thing, and I understand. That's why I understand why these young brothers is is going through life. You know, kind of lost because first of all, be your own man. Don't be nobody's follow or be a leader if you're going to do something make sure you do it because it's you not because somebody else wants you to do it and you end up not coming home and that that's what i'll be trying to tell the young kids all the time yo be yourself do what you want to do if you're going to do something and don't tell on nobody once you get committed to something you get caught that's on you don't be weak and get under the lights and start telling on everybody because that's not cool and i don't care what nobody says it's not cool in the 70s, we were just, you know, getting, starting to feel ourselves, you know, we we getting at that age where we 15 and whatever and trying to, you know, make things happen. So I start, me and my man, James started selling, Jamal, we started selling weed, loose joints. So we were selling loose joints and, you know, making a little bit of money off of that. We were selling them joints and we going down to them parks, 14th Street and doing our thing and you know we young so the older guys is like oh they, look at these little hustlers so they 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 had no problem with us getting that money out there when we selling them joints in the 70s but then we start getting so popular everybody's trying to come get them loose joints from us so after a while we getting a couple of thousand a day from these people so we eating in their we eating out their pockets so um, one night I was a little late getting down there so James went by himself and he, they stuck him up when he got down there and took his took his product and told him, yo, don't don't come back down there, we're gonna kill you. Now these are the dudes that was letting us hustle. Said did this. So they said, don't come back down there, we're gonna kill you. So when um I got down there, I didn't see him, but I, I felt something was wrong. So I shot back uptown, and then he told me, yo, them niggas robbed me. So I said, oh, that's it for that. We can't, we can't mess around with that, you know? So then we was robbing me. We was doing all types of shit. I was robbing the prostitutes, and, you know, I used to rob the prostitutes, and I um, have somebody choke them, and I go in there with the glove and take their money to Hunts Point Market, and the pimps be chasing us. But, you know, they couldn't, they didn't have no, their guns couldn't be on them because the police be cruising through there. So they chase us, and we run. And then, um, you know, we hide on the side of the cars and you can hear them, we're going to get these motherfuckers one day. So one day they came to the park where I play ball at because 48 Park was right up the street. And they was like, we know one of you motherfuckers is robbing, robbing our, our, our hoes. 
And if we find out who it is, we're going to kill you. You know, and all this type they doing. They selling death tickets. And, you know, so we stopped robbing the prostitutes. So, so it's always something that made us have to come to an end to doing things. So that's what it was. And then um, I start, I start um, sticking shit up. He's robbing, just robbing drug dealers. We was robbing um, electronic stores, you know, movie theaters. I robbed, I robbed the um, Beacon Theater one time. <laughs> and it was funny when I, I was with these two dudes and they was like, yo, uh, they knew they knew all the angles to the spot. So we go in there, we robbed these joints. And I, I think I I think I got like 5,000 from them. And we running through the, through the, the show. So what happened, right? Uh, this nigga got me running into the ward, blank, uh, you know, so he's supposed to know how to get in and out. So what happened, well, we ended up, um, we ended up um, separating. So I ran down steps and I'm, I'm running through the audience now because, you know, they, they after us and I had a white hoodie on. So my man Vincent was like, yo, yo, shoot, what you doing? I said, yo, you got somebody sitting next to you? He's like, Nah, he said, come on, sit down. So I sat down. I had to take my hoodie off, and you see the police, they coming through there looking for a dude. And I had the money. So, you know, I kept the money because I was so mad at what that dude did. He made me into a, a war where we we, we, we could have got arrested. So I was doing all kind of crazy stuff when it comes to that, you know, robbing and stuff. And yeah, so now, you know, the end of the 70s come, we're going into the 80s. I'm getting tired of getting high. You know, um, I still was robbing, but I, I, you know, I was like, this, this cocaine shit is really, I'm not feeling it like I used to. So actually I ended up stopping before I got arrested. But like, like they say, all good things come to, to an end. And they, um, they was on me and they finally, um, of course somebody snitched on me and, um, we have all these people in there and um, they saw his BMW. So he ended up telling on me, talking about, and had his sister call me, talking about, yo, shoe, uh, break out. They, they found out who you are. I said, yeah, motherfucker. Tell him because I know they found out how they found out. He told on me, you know what I'm saying? So I broke out. So I I caught myself trying to be slick, you know, and and I'm, I'm, I'm chilling and, um, the police come to my house, and my and my mother answered the door, and she's like, they like my mother. Listen, a mother is the best thing to have. Trust me. And if, if you got your mother still alive, cherish that. <laughs> they came, the police came, the detectives came in there. They said, uh, "Do you have a son named um, Peter Shoe?" And she's like, "Yeah, that's my son." He said, uh, "Can we come in?" So he came in. They said, where's he at? She said, oh, he's away at school. So they looking at the pictures in the house. But well, my mother changed all the pictures and put a black guy instead of me, which is black and Chinese. So now in all the pictures, there's a black guy in there. So they was like, this is Peter? She said, yeah, that's him. So <laughs> the funny thing is, like, all right, they leave. So I, she said, she called me, you know, when I called, she said, you could come back home, they left. So I, when I came back two weeks later, I'm in the house chilling. And then all of a sudden, you know, my man, Melo, he was like, yo, let's go play some ball. So I said, bet, let's go play. So I put my 357 in, in a big pony bag. I got the 357, the towel, and the basketball, because I always had my gun on me. So I go, I coming out, we coming down the block. And you know, he's playing and trying to strip the ball for me. And I spun, and I spun right into the handcuffs. Them niggas cuffed me up. I, I, so I thought I was gonna get away. They cuffed me. And um, I said, well, can I at least get my bag to my man? He, they said, yeah, go ahead. So they would have kept the bag. They would have found the 357, which they were saying what I was using for the robberies. So they, they got the bag. I end up, um, Going to um, Rikers Island. I went to, no, I went to Bronx County first. And, um, you know, I had a $5,000 bail. My family bailed me out. 
I come out. Before I could get to hug him, they cuffed me again. I said, you want him? He'd be in Rikers Island. They, have, they hit me with another case. So I had to get bailed out again for 5,000 more. So I was going through some, some really um, mental anguish at that time. So I went to Rikers Island and you know, Bronx County is, is different because Bronx County is so small, you had the, the cells and you're looking through the TVs through the cells. So you really, you had a little rec, little area where you come out and eat and stuff, but Rikers Island is different. Rikers Island, when I was in there, was kind of wild, and you had to hold your own. And I remember when I first got in there, when I came through Rikers Island, and um, these guys was looking at me coming through there. He was like, yo, what size is your jacket? I said, your size. Because I knew, I knew what to say. I was already programmed. Your size. So they said, all right, all right. So now I'm like, oh, I'm, these niggas going to try me. So when I get to the mess hall, I run into the older dudes that knew me. It was like, Peter, shoot, that's, what are you doing in here? <laughs> you know, so they didn't know I was robbing everything. So I was like, they said, where you at? I said, I'm in one upper. So they said, all right, we coming up there. Don't worry about it. So there was a big homie from the Bronx named Big Bear. So he came up in one upper and he said, listen, I'm telling you something now. If Peter, if this little Peter has any problems up here, I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna tear niggas out the frame. So after that, everybody start, you know, chilling with me, showing me love, cause I was a little skinny kid. So then I got bailed out again. Once I get bailed out, you know, I'm chilling. But you know, but while we was in Vikings Island, it was a lot of guerrilla warfare going on in there. We're fighting over the phones. Um, Stabbings on, you know, it's a regular stupid shit, and you had to pick and choose. And I was in there with some strong dudes, you know, from the from the ex, and you know, we we had to hold it down. But you know, I was the youngest and I was the skinniest, and I just had to deal with what came. But once once um, you know, I was I was always protected. Then the guys was like, yo, you gotta hold your own. So they made me knuckle up. You know, a one on one, you know, and if you lose, you lose. So that's how it was. So when I came home in the 80s for a minute, I ended up going back to jail and do four years. So, because I stabbed the dude, because when we was in jail, you know, I was real nice and bored at the time. So everybody used to bet on me, and um, this dude caught, caught his feelings. And he was like, yo, you lost the game. He's like, you know, Niggas is betting on the game. And he's like, all oh, your niggas will suck my dick. So that's a no-no in jail. So I said, what? So that nigga said, you heard me all y'all. So when he went back to the shower, I ran up there with a knife and I, I stabbed him up. And um, I tried to run, but I ran right into the police. So after that, you know, I went to the hole and did some more time in the hole. So when I finally came home from jail, it was 1988. Now it's, you know, they had a party for me. They welcomed me home. I'm I'm lost, you know. I'm trying to get in where I fit in, you know, what I'm going to do, wondering what I'm going to do. And I tried to do the right thing. I tried to get a job and everything. So when I went to the, um, back to the phone company where I used to work for before, they um, snuck me in to the, to the, um, a company in the company downtown on 375 Pearl Street. But what happened, you know, the supervisor that didn't like me, he ended up um is dropping on my phone call and I'm you know when it says you check the application, have you ever been convicted? I said no. But he was he was checking up on me, keeping like wiretapping me and I I went to the um I was calling my PO and he heard the conversation. So I'm sitting in my that's, you know, at the computer, it's like 300 people on each floor, and these four security guards come, armed security guards, and, and uh, in the phone company, and they come by, and they come, and I'm like, oh shit, who they going to get? So everybody looking, you know, being nosy, you know, so they keep coming towards me. So I was like, yo, who the fuck? And the next thing you know, is um, Mr. Shoe, log out. 
So I, I, I logged out. So they took me into the um, a room and you got eight white people in front of me. You know, uh, you know why you in here? I was like, no, I don't. They said, yeah, you lied on your application where it says you've ever been convicted. So why did you lie? I said, well, I didn't think you were hiring me if I said I was convicted. So they said, well, we want you to resign. I said, I'm not resigning. You have to fire me. So what happened, um, my supervisor came in there and she's like, we can't, she was black. She said, we can't do nothing for him because he's, he's an excellent worker and he knows, he knows everything about the computers. So he said, no, we don't like liars. So that day when they walked me out, that was the lowest point in my life. Getting into, I had a Cherokee Limited at the time that Big D got me. So I'm driving up the highway, ready, want to just drive off the cliff, drive off the bridge and kill myself. So on my way to the, on, on the bridge, you know, I wanted to drive off that bridge so bad. So, you know, tears was in my eyes because I tried to do the right thing. Man. I was like, damn, I, I don't want to go back to jail. So I shoot back home. My mother's crying because she already got the word, the, the lady in the phone company. Because that's another thing. They was trying to give me, to give up who, who got me in. And I'm not, you know, I'm never going to tell them nothing. So I, when I got home to my mom, she's crying. I said, look, straight up, mom, I try to do it the right way. Don't ask me to, to work again. Now, now is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it my way. So she cried, and then the PO called me because the PO found out, and she was like, don't worry, you know, you get another job. Boom, boom, I said, listen, no disrespect, Miss Smallwood. I'm not working no more. You can have me come in every day, every week. That job shit is over for me. And that's when I turned to the life of crime. Now, meanwhile, I got a present from um, Big D, and I didn't know what it was, so, you know, I never opened it. I thought it was a gun, to tell you the truth. But, you know, days go by, and I start smelling something. So I opened the joint, and it was a key of coke. So I started laughing. I said, this nigga D crazy. So I called him up. And um, he said, yo, this is what's happening out there now, you know? You gotta learn to put the, you know, get this crack shit going. So he walked me through it to cook it. And I, I, you know, I had waited till my mother went to work. And I cooked it. I messed that whole key up. I barely got back what, what the key cost. So my next mission was to hire a chef. So I had to hire a chef and then it was on and popping. I started selling that. That coke out there, having it cooked up and put it out on the streets. Then, um, you know, everything's not only being a gangster. Everything comes with luck. You could walk outside and miss a million dollars, and somebody could walk out there and see that same million dollars and get it. So don't think that you, you know, you, you, you got skills because you, you got rich on the drugs. A lot of that is, it has to be luck involved, not just your expertise. So I stumbled across something. When my, my little man came to me, he was like, yo, there's these Africans got the, got the head on, but they scared to move it. So I was like, all right, because, you know, back in them days, the Africans was getting involved. Everybody, you know, they were involved, and the Africans wouldn't fight back. they just take the robbery. So I started moving the, the, the weight of the, the dope. So I started getting that, and I was moving that. And I'm making 50000 off that joint every time we move the key because I'm selling it for 100 something thousand and it was only charging us 50 So I get money to the mule and me and Tim break down. So then after that, you know, I got cooked up with the Chinese people. So now I'm selling China white and, and um, the African dope. So I'm feeling, my, I'm feeling like, you know, like I'm that nigga now. So we, we just blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. And like I said, you know, sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time. So we we, we, we selling it to all the dope, dope dealers. You know, some of these dope dealers is coming two keys every two days. So, you know, it's like they were big time um, dope, dope dealers, all the big labels. So we was like, yo, um, this shit is crazy. This is quick, fast money. So after we start getting fast money, you know, then I meet this girl. And when I meet this girl, you know, I start, um, she, she's from Florida, but she, 
she had her family was pushing that that coat that coat to the weight. So when I got plugged in with that, you know, um, the brother told me he's like, yo, I could push. He said, how many how many kids you could push? And I was like, yo, whatever you get us. So I told my partners, and they was like, yo, grab them shit. So he gave us 250 keys at one at, in the beginning. And we didn't have to go get them or nothing. They just shipped to New York for us. And I started giving out. Them shit went so fast. I brought back his money so quick. He was like, yo. He was wondering if I was a fez in there. So, but then he told me, he said, listen, I'll bless you with a lot of keys, but this is what you're going to have to do for me. And I said, what? I said, what? He said, you got to stop seeing my sister. I do not want my sister with, a, with somebody that can go to jail forever or get killed. So if you do that, I'll start blessing you with the keys. So it was hard for me to leave her because I don't want to say her name, but it was hard for me to leave her because she was bad. 10 plus. Crazy body and everything. But I ended up having to back up on her and she, you know, she hated me for it. She cried. But... I had to do it for the business. And I told my partners, and it was like, yeah, you gotta take one for the team. And I took it, and uh, we started, next trip they gave us 500 bricks. Then we started moving those, and it kept going up and up, man. I was worried that we had to separate where the bricks go, because, you know, if the police bust the stash and they get all them bricks, I'm gonna pay that back, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we separate, started separating the bricks and putting them in different places. This way, if we take a loss, we make it up on the end. So at that time, I was getting, I was getting the keys for ten thousand a key, and I'm selling them for no less than fifteen. And some some people twenty, twenty one, you know, depends on who, how close he was to me. And I'm giving out consignment. I'm giving it to all the people that you know I got love for. And, you know, I know everybody. So niggas was coming to get them shits like hotcakes. And me and me and D and the rest of our people, we just moving them joints and having fun. And you know, the thing about me and D. We just used to hang out, party. We could go here, we could go to Vegas, we could go to Miami, we could go to Atlanta. We just had fun because he's a party animal like me. So we just, every, everywhere we at, we like the dynamic do and everybody want to be where we at. So they want, if they know we coming somewhere, they know they're going to go to breakfast with us or whatever, whatever. And people just wanted to just hang out with us because... We, we were the life of the party. We make things happen. Yeah, so it was getting hectic, man. We getting so much money bouncing back and forth, you know. <laughs> the girl's stealing, you know. If the girl wasn't your number one girl, you had to worry about that because my, my snipers, boy, they really get me D and D nice. And, you know, the, the number one, you safer. But other than that, anything can happen. We had a couple of real rules. D came up with a rule. I think, I think we couldn't touch nobody's top three girls after a while. We, could, we get money and we spend the money on everybody. The shit was getting so happy. We start off uh, trying to figure out we want to watch the money. The guys out of town, they was getting homesick because they got families in you know home. So, you know, they came to me. My birthday was coming up and uh, they came to me and they said, Yo, shoot, why don't we have to throw a party for your birthday? And I was like, I don't really want to do that. It was, they talked me into it, so they went to they went to Nice and Deep, and they was like, yeah, and Kool Aid. I forgot about Kool Aid, and they went to that, and they was like, yeah, you know, let's throw a party for his birthday. So we did the party. We had Keith Sweat and, and Touch performing, and uh, we had the party, and it was a success. We had like 2,500 people in there in our first party, and. Uh, Everybody came, you know, so afterwards, you know, the, the lieutenants and everything, they was like, yo, yo, shoot, we should have a party every month. I started laughing. I said, well, this is the deal. If y'all if 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 finish up your packages by that time, then we'll throw a party. We'll throw it every other month. This way it gives you a chance to clean up your ass on the street. So they, they make their money you know, come back and give us what they had to give us, and then uh, we'd throw a party. So we started constantly throwing parties, 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 you know, and then uh, we go into the parties now, you know, we never took pictures before, never never did stuff like that until 
add you. Let them know I'm going to have to give pictures, take pictures because to promote the parties and put them on the flyers, flyers and stuff. So they said, all right, cool. But they wasn't taking pictures. You know, D, D wasn't taking pictures. Nice wasn't taking pictures. Cool wasn't taking pictures in the beginning. So I, I'm, I'm pushing it. I'm pushing the pictures, you know, with me and girls. So we still throwing the parties in them, you know, we killing them. Maybe nobody could have a party when I had a party because we, we knocked them out the box. Anywhere we go, you know, everybody want to know when we throwing another party. So uh, all the other promoters, if they knew my party was coming up, they would never try to battle us and have it at the same time because they'll lose. So now, you know, I go to a party and um, for my man's birthday, the Crane Club, it was Chaz's birthday. We go over there to the Crane Club, and there was a girl I was trying to get to go with me. It was her birthday, too. And um, so it was so crowded. Somebody, they was acting crazy in there, you know. So I ain't with that shit. I, I walked around to um, Chaz and Wilson's, which is a hot spot on a Sunday night, too. So when I went in there, you know, I'm at the bar. I'm talking to some girls, and Madonna sends a guy over to me and he says um Madonna wants to meet you you know and she said she said um can you come over I said tell her I like my woman like my coffee black and I started laughing I was just joking but he went back over there to her and then she came over to me and she tapped me on my shoulder she said that's you know that was a racist comment I was like man I was just joking but you know after that She's like, well, you, can you come over and, and kick it with me for a little while? So I went and talked to him, was talking to her, we started kicking it, and the next thing you know, you know, she told me she likes my eyes and can we go out together and stuff like that. And I said, cool. So she took my number and I took hers. So then she said, I got to go because I got to get up. So I said, all right. So she, she kissed me on her cheeks and she, she left. So I go back to the party try to get that girl that I wanted to take her off that night and somebody shoots up in the air you know so when they shoot up in the air everybody starts scattering so when they start scattering you know um, I'm like kneeling down trying to figure out what's going on where everybody's at you know and Puffy Puffy running crazy like he was worried about something happening I said yo I said stay put before you get your ass shot so I, I pulled him down to stay behind me. I pulled my gun out and I start calling out names. So I would call out. I said, yo, you know, Big D, I didn't hear him. So I said, Preem. And Preem said, yo, I'm over here. I said, yo, what's, what happened? And he told me, yo, somebody shot up in the air. So I said, all right, I'm coming out. So I came out and we all went upstairs. And then they all arguing outside and, um, they, you know, dudes is arguing, Chaz is twisted, you know, so everything's going haywire, so I was like, yo, listen, everybody go home, man, this shit is just, it ain't about nothing, you know, boom, 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 so niggas left, went home, and my people, I lost the girl, I was trying to take off, and my people go off, that's when the day we had the beepers, and my people go off, and there's the 212 heavier code, so I call, and then the next thing you know, it's Madonna calling me, so she said, what you doing? I ain't doing nothing now because the girl done left I'm by myself. So she said, why don't you come by? So I think the place was on 60-something street, 64th street. I was on 70, 72nd street. So I shot down to her, her, her crib and went up to the her loft, went up on the loft, and uh, the doorman, and uh, she answered the door. She had a seafood negligee on, and you know what happened next, you know. So that's how me and her started swinging. So, you know, the word on the street was getting around and people were saying, yo, you can shoot Bang and McDonald. And so I had to um, deal with my girl who was like here in the rumors too. And she was like, you know, and she was a bad girl. I don't know. I, I'm mad that I get lost to her too. She was um, black and white. And she, she, um, was going through changes with me, but we crying and you know the rumors. So I end up taking her to um, Aruba and St. Martin's. But what happened was I was supposed to be in the video called The Secret, 
and you could go look at it and, and there's a guy in there that looked like me to play that part and um, I was going to get paid to do that so I ended up just breaking out and trying to pass things up get my girl back on the right track but it ain't work out like that so when I got came back I was like yo just pack your shit and you know it's over so that being said then I went back to um, McDonough and she was in um, they was halfway doing the the, the video shoot and I even helped to get the place in Harlem to do it so when I got back there she was mad at me so you know she started mouthing off and I, I just like you know fuck you too broke out on her so now I lost two girls in one shot <laughs> so you know I end up going back and doing what I was supposed to do stay focused on my drug game and then you know at the, at the, before all that happened, though, I had met uh, this old lady named Arlene Brickman, and Arlene Brickman became an undercover informant that helped get me locked up. And um, so I ended up dealing with um, what I have to deal with. And, you know, then, then we had ran out of, they, we ran out of drugs, it was a drought. And we all had to wait to see if things going to get better. And the connects was like, you know, that which promised me I would never, I would never be empty. I was empty. So now I'm like trying to get any keys I could get. And you know, my people on the streets, they 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 pressing me like, yo, you know, we need this, we need that, you know. And I'm tired of hearing their mouths, so. You know, I remember Arlene Whitman offering me a deal to do something, and I end up um, trying to make the move. To, but I never knew these people, so I was trying to buy the keys, and, uh, a couple of keys, and see if they was good. Then, then um, after I buy them and they good, then I was gonna buy more. So they said, no, you gotta buy ten or better. So oh, it was five or better. You gotta buy five or better. So I end up, I end up getting fifteen keys, eight on consignment. But what happened, a seven on consignment, but what happened, it was a setup, it was a federal agents, and they ended up bagging me, and I ended up going to jail. And as I went to jail, you know, I didn't get no bail, and I had to go to trials, and I had three trials, and I had two hung juries, one more hung jury, and they could only give me income tax evasion, but I lost the last trial, and I ended up getting 24 years, eight months, which I did 21 years, eight months to it. Getting into the industry and stuff, you know. The West Coast, right? Them people in the music industry was real gangsters. The East Coast didn't have them people in play because we didn't care about that. And so the West Coast thought we were sore until they got got to meet the real brothers for in there, you know. Um, so what happened was um, they was picking on the East Coast dudes and slapping them up and all that and you know we had to put a stop to that because that shit was, that shit was making New York look weak so you know between us and the brothers that's, that's, that's deep and can handle stuff you know we got to know them and should not get to meet us and that's when he wanted us to do the East Coast death row Talking to D and them, and um, MC Hammer, Eric B, um, you know, Supreme Chaz. You know, it was, it was, it was something that would have been real good if we could have gotten together, but everybody went to jail. You know, I went to jail, Shug went to jail, so that's that's what it was. But you know, um, Tuffy always talks about how P Diddy always wanted to be like me. They was always trying to copy my style, you know. So, you know, and then I see, you know, a lot of the brothers now, and they be like, sure, you open the door for a lot of things to happen. But they don't publicize that for me, I guess, because I was a drug dealer. Now, if I was a normal person, they were like, oh, you know, that's Dapper Dan, that's this and that's that. But because of who I was, they won't acknowledge what I did. Just like for the Rucker, you know, 
I made the record real, real high, 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 um, high level when I put my team in there. So everything we did, we left a, a, a mark. And the rappers, you know, they still put my name in their songs. Um, people was trying to dress like me when we was doing the black tie affairs. People try to um, move like us. They was trying to do, you know, it was just, uh, uh, and I'm flattered behind all that because it's a legacy, but, you know, I didn't want people to follow my footsteps and end up going to jail and do all that time because I don't care how much money you get, you know, it's the time does not level out the money you get. And then being away from your family and stuff, and what crushed me the most is leaving my mom while she was sick and having to beg God to let her hold on and my kids who was two was three and one was five so that really hurt me too and then um that's where we went with that but you know it's like we have a we have a trend out there now with brothers brothers and, 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 and sisters they need to stop wanting to kill each other they need to just help each other there's nothing wrong with helping any Anybody. Nobody's going to get your money. You're going to get your own money for what you're worth. So because you help another person now, you know, these people out here now feel that they 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 losing money. Nah, what you're doing is you're gaining allies, allies that will come to light in, in, in your, your end of, your, of what you need done. And you might need them when you're down and out. Because right now I go to people that I, I make sure is all right and they don't want to help me. You know, and the reason they don't want to help me is because I'm against the principles of what's going on out there in the world with, with, you know, I don't want to elaborate on, but you could, you could be between the lines and what I don't like and I want, and what I don't appreciate. And that's where we at. Yeah, so everything being said, you know, everybody says, and I don't run, run with this because you know, I'm not the type that blow, blows his own horn, but they say I, I open the door for a lot of things and, you know, the industry giving, giving people the chance to do parties and, and um, perform and comedians and DJs and everything that was, you know, part of my life. And, you know, also, it was a lot of people that was coming to me I don't want to put names out there trying to get me to manage them or produce them and stuff like that. But I, we was getting too much money on the street, so I, I, I backed up. I didn't want to get involved in that. And, um, you know, the thing is that a lot of, even now, you know, a lot of the songs that was made by the rappers and, and even the movies they, they with, with the uh, Empire, Power, and all that, that's a lot of them stories is from us, it's our lives. And, some other guys are probably all over the United States. So real, real dudes that was caught up in the light and hell, 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 what? And I, I, I salute all them brothers that, that, that was out there getting money and was making, setting the trend, you know, dress wise. And because at one time I had all the coochies that, that was out. Me, Chaz, D, all of us had, we was, that was our thing, wearing all the coochie sweaters. So, all the gators, you know, all everything, you know, Dapper Dan stuff, Dapper Dan, salute to him, because he, he did he does a lot for um, society, period, not just Harlem, everybody always bring him Harlem society, because he was well known. I mean, so we, we as a team, you know, even though we not considered a team, we was a team in the trendsetters of everything, bringing music to life, bringing the rappers ideas to, to put their, um, music out with the the lyrics. We was the inspiration. So that being said, you know, everybody that came after us, they salute me and they they be happy to see me and you know and that and, and that really impresses me and that makes me feel feel good because of the because of that because it shows that I made a I put a dent in, in something in life instead of the negative stuff, you know, which, you know, like I said, I'm not rewarded, I'm not um, 
talked about on the positive side with, when it comes to the society because they don't want my drug dealing being the reason that everybody came up. So I, I, could, I, could, I could respect that. And I don't want people to think that, yeah, you know, Peter Shue had to get the, the drug game for him to make this happen. I wanted him to, to, to really love me from what I put in, in, in effort I put into, you know, giving out food to homeless people and stuff like that, and, and, and clothes, and, which we don't talk about. I don't never go and brag about that. What I do, it just happens. I don't never want nobody to know that, like these other clowns that be out there, want people to know what they're doing for people. That's that, to get, you know, cheering from society. No, that's your personal relationship with God, and that's the only one supposed to know that you're doing good things, you know, is you and God. And I still do that now, you know. As for, you know, me going to jail and having to deal with that 20-something years, it wasn't easy, trust me. It was real rough. I had to pray every day because, you know, just to keep my mother alive, man. And, you know, there's, there's, there's so many incidents where I got a, that that could be a movie. Cause I got on the phone one time with my mother and they had to operate on her heart again. And to hear this from my mother crushed me. She told me, this might be the last time you be talking to me. And I said, why you say that, mom? She said, I don't think I'm gonna make it through this next operation. And she said, because they have to go and open my heart again. So I was like, I didn't know what to say to her. I was like, mom, just pray on everything, it'll be all right. When I hung up the phone with her that day, I went back to my cell and cried like a baby. So I prayed on it. A lot of spiritual brothers came in there and it was crazy. Muslims and Christians came in there and prayed with me to, to um, because God says if you, if you, that's why I know there's a God. He said if you come to him with two or more people, the prayers will be answered. And that's what happened. And, um, the next morning when I got up, I was nervous, I was scared to call, but I called my sister and she said, you ain't gonna believe what happened. I said, what happened? She said, they had sedated my mother had on the operation table, get ready to operate, and right when he was getting ready to cut her open, the medicine finally kicked in and her heart stopped beating right. And he said, we don't have to operate, take her back upstairs. Now, if that ain't God's word and God's actions, you tell me what it is. So, there's things, you know, missing my kids, you know, wondering, am I gonna survive, not getting ill or sick or whatever, and you know, it, so 20 something years I had to go through that, and I was poisoned by the, by the police, and, and I, I survived that, because I had a fight with the police and they poisoned me. So when I came home, everything was like me coming to another planet. Everything was different. And I can't understand how everything went left so so fast. I mean, you got guys out here killing their girls because they left them. If I if that's the case, if my if I killed every girl that left me, I would kill about 40 girls. You know what I'm saying? So I was always was getting busted for fooling around back in the day. But the whole thing is, you know. I see things a lot different. They're not, they're, they're, there's not a grasp on the children no more. The, the parents don't have a grasp on their kids. The kids is running wild. You're joining all these gangs and stuff, and what's happening is, you know, that's the downfall. You have to be your own leader. You have to do what, if you're gonna do wrong, do wrong, but don't team up with nobody, especially people you don't know, and then what happens, you know, y'all get busted, and they're going, there's always gonna be a weak link and he's gonna tell on all of y'all. So be a leader, don't be a follower. And I'm not promoting crime, I'm not promoting nothing, but love me people more. Listen, you get more out of, right? Try this one day, helping an old lady with her bags, uh, talking to somebody that's going through depression. You get more of a high than going out there shooting somebody. I've been through all of it, I know. You get more of a high, you get so much of a, you feel so good. And that's what we need to start doing. We need to start loving again. We need to start caring. We need to start. Back in the day, you couldn't rob no old lady in the neighborhood. You couldn't do certain things. 
because the whole neighborhood would get your ass. But now, people don't even care. They just beating up on old ladies. I just seen it. Knock the lady off off the steps and 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 going to church. Who does that? You don't get no gangster points for that. You ain't a gangster. You know what you do. What you do right now is seek God. If you're going through something, seek Him. Pray. If you believe in um, Allah, pray. Do it. Whatever you believe in Buddha, pray. But you got to get off this violence thing where. We just killing each other, like for no reason. What you looking at? You stepped on my foot. This and that, 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 that. What is that about? Man, when, when you go to war, let it be for something that's real serious, not something that, you know, you you just don't have no conclusion of what you was thinking about. And don't and don't think that you're gonna get away. Nobody gets away no more. You're going to jail. You're gonna do life. If you beef over a girl, you're gonna get killed or you're gonna go to jail. So the girl's still gonna move on with somebody else. So you're still gonna lose the girl. So let's tighten up, let's let's sharpen up, let's be, let's be men again. You can't teach a man how to be a man. Either he is or he ain't. Hey, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and listening to Bitch in the Hood, my brother Val. Up and coming superstar. And guess who's next after me? My man, Sean Hartwell. And Sean Hartwell and me have history. We was locked up together. Good dude. We had, we had to go through trials and tribulations in the dicks. But he's up next, so you can stay tuned and you know, listen to all these documentaries on YouTube and support the blacks. Peace. <laughs>